So now that we've talked about concurrency in general, let's kind of lower or narrow in, zoom in on how concurrency is achieved in Java. So in Java, the core of concurrency today is supported by something called a Java thread, which is implemented, surprise, surprise, as an object. And that's because Java threads have been around since day one. First version of Java had threads. The first many years of Java, the first 15 years or so of Java, or no, I guess more like 20 years of Java, first 20 years of Java, Java, Java was pretty much purely an object-oriented programming language, so no surprise, a Java thread would be an object. What does that mean? Pragmatically, it means it had methods and fields. So each Java thread has certain resources that are unique to it. It has its own stack, it has its own registers, it has its own instruction pointer, it has its own thread local storage, and so on and so forth. Here are some of the methods that are exposed, but basically that's what it means to be an object in this context. A thread object in Java can be in multiple, well, it can be in various states, one, one state at a time, and it transitions between the states. We will not go through these states in detail right now. I will cover them later when we talk about threading and its internals in more detail. But in a nutshell, when you make a new thread, it just goes to this state. When you start the thread, it becomes potentially runnable. When the operating system scheduler and virtual machine scheduler decide to run it, it becomes running. And then as it's running, it can do various things and it can transfer into the waiting blocked, timed waiting states and so on and back to runnable. We'll talk about those things in more detail. Don't worry about the details right now. And then when we're all done and the thread terminates, it, remo it returns from something called the run method, the run hook method, and it's, it's finished its computation. So again, we'll go through this in a lot more detail. You don't have to understand that at the moment. So starting Java threads sets the wheels in motion, and that's great, and you'll get some experience with that for program 1A. But what's really interesting about threads is not just starting them, it's coordinating them, allowing them to interact with each other. And there's two general ways that threads can interact. One is by using shared objects, and the other is by using message passing. So shared objects are used to synchronize the behavior of one or more threads so that certain properties are preserved or ensured. And we typically do this with various kinds of synchronizers or locks. And the purpose of this is typically to ensure that only one thread at a time is accessing the resources of an object within its so-called critical section. And I'll obviously go through this in a lot more detail. And other threads that need to access those resources are blocked, awaiting their turn to go in. And we'll talk a lot about that. The properties you're trying to preserve through these shared objects are first and foremost mutual exclusion, which means that only one thing at a time is accessing shared mutable state. So you don't want to corrupt that state. You don't want to have what are called race conditions. And uh, race conditions are basically hazards, a hazard of concurrency that occurs when the correct execution of a program depends on the timing or the order of execution of the threads that are running in it. And if you have race conditions, it means that you end up corrupting shared mutable state so that threads will see different values that should instead be consistent. So that's one of the big things. Mutual exclusion avoids race conditions. And the second thing you do with shared objects is you coordinate, which means that operations occur in the right order, at the right time, and under the right conditions. So that's more about coordinating and orchestrating and so on, the way in which things will run. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of Java synchronizers, so we will, and which we will cover all of these. Uh, synchronized statements and methods, rentrant locks, atomic operations, semaphores, condition objects, and compare and swap operations. And you'll actually get a chance to program pretty much all of these things. And you'll get a chance to program them in the context of the Palantiri simulator application where you'll be writing the synchronizers to mediate access to the fixed number of Palantiri and then sharing those fixed number of Palantiri amongst the beings, which of course will be threads. 
And you'll see I'll have all kinds of funny symbols to indicate this stuff. Like you'll see this symbol used a lot. This means mutual exclusion. This means coordination. And this means atomic <coughs> access. And I'll explain all those visualizations when we get to them. The second form of interaction mechanisms available to concurrent objects and threads is message passing. And message passing, as the name implies, involves sending one or more messages from a producer thread or producer threads to one or more consumer threads via some type of thread safe queue. So you'll typically have something called a blocking queue. And the rule is if the queue is empty and a thread wants to take something out of the queue, they'll wait, they'll block until there's something in the queue. And if a thread wants to put something in the queue and the queue is full, then that thread will wait until the queue is not full. So not empty, not full, that's, that's typically how you do message passing. There are lots of message passing mechanisms in Java as well. We will cover some of them. You will get a chance to play with some of them. I will explain the implementations and we'll walk through the source code for some of them. The most common ones would be things like array and link blocking queues, priority blocking queues, synchronous queues, and concurrent linked queues. And you'll get a chance to play around with some of these. In practice, a lot of this stuff is hidden for you behind higher level programming frameworks, which we'll talk about later. So that's a quick overview of the ways of sharing and coordinating by either using shared objects that use synchronizers or message passing, which have these basically buffers, which also use synchronizers to protect them. And they have certain rules about when you can put things in and when you can take things out. What I want to do is kind of wrap up a discussion here, focusing on some of the hazards that can arise if you program multi-threaded applications and don't correctly use shared objects and message passing. So either you have a bug in your code or you pick the wrong mechanism. <clears throat> Usually you have a bug in your code. Um, and this really boils down to something called thread safety. So here are, the, here are three of the kinds of things that can go wrong in your multi-threaded programs if you don't use shared objects or message passing properly. The first one is, is this racing edition concept, which I mentioned briefly before. And that occurs when a program depends on the sequence or the timing of the threads in order for it to operate properly. And we'll talk a lot about this. You'll get a chance to see this firsthand. You'll get a chance to write code or look at code that if done improperly will have race conditions. And basically what would happen here is you'd end up with two threads trying to access some shared mutable resource, some shared mutable object or field in an object. And one of them would be trying to write to it while another one was trying to read to it. And if you didn't properly synchronize access to that field or that object, you'd end up corrupting it. So you'd have incorrect values or inconsistent values. And I will show you lots and lots of examples to make that very clear. It's really a simple concept once you get down to it. But uh, this is one of the things that drives people completely insane when they start writing concurrent programs because they're often not familiar with synchronization and they set all the wheels in motion with the threads and then they get really strange results or their program blows up. You're actually better off if your program blows up than getting really strange results, because it's often hard to recognize why your really strange results are wrong. Whereas if your program blows up, you get a pretty in, a good indication things are, have gone awry. If you want to see a fun example of, of a buggy program that has race conditions in it, try running this uh, buggy queue program in my GitHub account. And it indicates what happens if you have producer and consumer threads trying to share a queue that doesn't have any synchronization in it. And as you might expect, chaos and insanity ensues. And it, it's uh, actually a great teaching guide for what not to do. Another big problem you'll run into, and we will cover this extensively later, is the concept of memory inconsistencies. And this is a little different from a race condition, although it often manifests itself in a similar way. And these types of errors occur when different threads in a process have inconsistent views of what should be the same data values or the same consistent data values. And I, again, I'm a big fan of uh, you know, visualizing things. So there's lots of examples of this, depending on what generation you are and what kind of TV shows you like to watch. So if you've ever watched Star Trek, you probably are familiar with the concept of the transporter beam. So a transporter is something that needs to be atomic, right? If you beam from you know, Enterprise to some planet, 
you need to show up entirely there. You don't want to leave like half the person one place, the other half the other place, right? Because there'll be inconsistencies. It'd be bad. So that's an example of an atomic operation. If you're a Harry Potter fan, then you may be familiar with the concept of splinching, which is occurring when you're trying to disapparate from one place to another. And in fact, I forget which book it is. It might be Goblet of Fire or something like that, where they are first learning how to apparate and disapparate and so on. And uh, when you're first learning, you do it wrong. And so you end up like leaving your nose one place and your arm someplace else. Another example of inconsistencies where things should be done atomically. So same thing is true with data. You don't want to have multiple threads thinking they're getting access to the same field in an object only to discover that they each have their own local copy in a processor core cache that are not consistent. Bad news. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a lot of detail. Yet another problem that can go wrong with concurrent programs is deadlock, which is also known as circular embrace or the deadly embrace. And this occurs when you have two or more competing threads that are waiting for another thread to finish its job and they each hold each other's resources, and so they never make any progress. Here's a very simple example. We have thread one and thread two. Thread one owns lock L1. Thread two owns lock L2. And thread one needs L2, and thread two needs L1. So if this thread owns that lock and tries to grab this lock, and this thread owns that lock and tries to grab this lock, They'll deadlock, and nothing, they can't proceed. And we'll talk to some extent about how to fix that problem. That, that's actually the type of topic that's well covered in a distributed algorithms class, because it's a fascinating, there's actually very interesting ways to avoid those problems. Okay, so that's a quick overview of concurrent programming in Java. But uh, again, don't, don't think we've covered enough to really master the art of everything you need to do. This is just starting things off.